I'm going to read you something before we start. As, uh, as we were worshiping, I was reminded again of a study I did a while back, a couple of years back on speaking in tongues. Now, I believe sometimes we do it in the flesh and sometimes we're in the spirit. To be honest, I don't think we're always speaking in the spirit. I think sometimes we, we know how to do it and we preempt it. I don't think we always wait for the spirit. That's my personal belief. You can disagree with me. <laughs> but I think some of the tongues has no power. It's a lot of gibberish. You could be saying rubber ducky, rubber ducky. So that some of the tongues sound like that in the spirit. She came in a Honda, she came in a Honda. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so it sounds like sometimes. And I believe sometimes the tongues are not in the spirit. Because the effect of it's not there. There's no presence of God, there's no power, there's nothing happening, it's just it's like a car trying to start and I think sometimes we're not dependent on the Holy Spirit, we've become religious so forgive me if I start there, but I do must just say that I do think sometimes Pentecostals have become even religious in speaking in tongues and we need to be so dependent on the Spirit and so full of the Spirit that it should bubble out of you with the power of the Spirit behind it, and there needs to be some effect. So I want to mention three or four scriptures to you in the book of Acts, and you can go take this home, you can go read it. I'm going to read it to you tonight, but I didn't actually prepare this message. <laughs> I prepared it when I'm standing here, so forgive me for that, but listen to this. In the book of Acts, there were many cases when the Spirit fell upon them that they started speaking in tongues. This is why the, the assemblies of God, over the years, one of the doctrines is the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. It's one of our doctrines that we believe in, one of our values that we have in the church and what we teach. And when the 120 on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2 verse 4, is one of the strongest grounds that we use as Pentecost to insist that everyone should speak in tongues. But everyone doesn't speak in tongues, and it doesn't make you lesser of a Christian. Let me tell you that. It doesn't make you lesser. Your salvation is not diminished because of that. Your salvation is just as strong. But there is something that you're missing, and it's something that I believe that God wants everyone to experience. Listen to this, what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues, even as the Spirit gave them to them to speak forth. Some say, okay, so then the people said they drunk when they came out of that place because Peter and them all were acting like drunk people, uh, like Sandy and them sometimes you're on a weeknight, a weekday, uh, and others, and you've been there before in meetings when everybody's half drunk, and some uh, say, well, yo, this can't be of God, but it happened on the day of Pentecost, because when you're so full of the Spirit, it's, 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 God, it's God just pouring out His, His Spirit in you that you cannot contain it anymore, and there's something that happens, and it's a bubbling over of those tongues. Now, the book of, in the book of Acts, in Pentecost, it was earthly tongues that they spoke there. It wasn't heavenly tongues on Acts chapter 2. It was earthly tongues because the people there could understand it. It was pointing that the earth will be evangelized by the Spirit. Amen. But people will go out from that place to go to all the nations. That's why those nations were there, could understand the praises of God in their own language. It's because it was a sign that this gospel will go out to all the nations. And, and so we, we can go further in the book of Acts if you want to write these down. The Gentiles at the house of Cornelius. Remember at the house of Cornelius. In the Bible, Acts chapter 10, verse 44 to 46. While Peter was still, listen to, I love this portion of Scripture. While Peter was still speaking those words, these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all, who? Some of them? 10%? 20%? All the people that were in the house of Cornelius. While he was still speaking to them, this fell upon all those hearing the word. And the believers who were of the, of the circumcision, as many as had accompanied Peter, were amazed because on the, Gentiles, on the Gentiles also the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out. For they heard them speaking in tongues and magnifying God. Isn't it amazing? They heard them speaking in tongues and what were they doing? Their tongues were praising God, lifting up the name. Just like we did in worship tonight, praising the name. So when tongues come, it's a praising to God. It's a upliftment to say, God, we worship you. And then we have, obviously, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, you can read the whole chapter, which speaks about 
the differentiating between when you speak in a tongue and there's no interpretation needed and when there is interpretation. In a meeting like this, if someone suddenly bursts forth in a tongue, we'll have to interpret it because it's better to speak with words we can understand than speak in words we cannot understand. So Paul was making a point that tongues is not there to boast that you're more holy than other people around. You're not there to try and confuse people and say, bara, 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 bara. look at me, I can speak in tongues. Ha, 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 ha. Because so many Christians boast with their tongues instead of using it in the way that God has given it to glorify God. There's a bubble coming out of my mouth. Hey, amazing stuff happening here. Okay, so then we go to the Ephesian believers. Let's go to Acts chapter 19 verse 6. It says, and when Paul laid his hands on them, so here's another manifestation. So first it was Peter just speaking over and, and witnessing of Christ and speaking of the Holy Spirit and Peter's speaking there and suddenly as he's speaking it falls there. But there's other instances where Paul laid hands on people and they received the Holy Spirit. And it says here, and when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Prophecy and tongues go together. Amen. So it's intelligent words. It's words that we can understand, but it's also words that we cannot understand. God communicating His Spirit straight to our spirit. That's why 1 Corinthians 14 says the mind is unfruitful when you speak in tongues. The mind is not involved in speaking. Isn't that an amazing phenomenon? Do you know that they've actually, they've actually proven medically, biologically, whatever you want to call it, scientifically, they link people up to a machine that speak in tongues and they show that there's no brain activity happening from the language part of the brain. Isn't that amazing? Come on, that's our God. That, that proves the Bible once again because science is looking for facts. And when science finds the truth, they find the Bible. <laughs> I mean, anything where people are searching for the truth, they're going to find the Word of God. And the Word of God has been proven like that. We know that it's the truth because we have faith in what the Bible says. But even when we link someone up to a machine that's linked to the brain where the brain is supposed to have a language part where that's activated when you speak English and Afrikaans and Zulu and Kosa and and Sisutu and all these languages, there's a part of the brain that becomes active, but when you speak in tongues, the brain is inactive. And the spirit is active. Isn't it amazing? I, I find that truly mind-blowing. <laughs> Amen? That that happens. And, and we're going we're gonna, to, 1 Corinthians 12, some will have the gift of speaking in tongues, it says there. Some speak in tongues in the evidence or manifestation of the Spirit, but others have a different manifestation. And so we have it happening in our meetings and we have interpretation of tongues. Isn't that powerful? To know when the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, there's an evidence of speaking in tongues. There's a, com there's a connection from heaven to earth that happens and there's an overflow of what happens in the Spirit and it's powerful. And so tonight I, I want to just touch on a few points. And we're not going to be very, very long, but we're going to pray for some people tonight. Is that okay? Are you hungry for God? I'm hungry for God. <laughs> Still hungry for God many, many years later. Hopefully you're hungry for God. Faith. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, come on, you can tell me. It's impossible. Uh-huh. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. Now, I believe there needs to be a sincere seeking after God. Amen. Without faith, you cannot please God. It's impossible to please God. Anything that you do outside of faith is not pleasing to God. Amen. You need to live by faith. You need to act by faith. You need to speak by faith. You need to think by faith. You need to... Have everything that you do in your life by faith. Amen? Because we live the faith life. The Christian is designed to live by faith. How do I know this? Because the righteous shall live by faith. Amen? When you don't live by faith, you live by flesh. And as we know we have flesh. And there's times when we're too much in the flesh in the church. And we keep on in the flesh and in the flesh. And what we see with our eyes instead of what we can see with our spiritual eyes. And sense with our spiritual ears and know what God's saying. We need to become sharp because it's only by faith that you can please God. How many of you want to please God? Come on, I'm one of them. I want to please God. I don't say I want to be displeasing to you, Lord. No, we want to please God. We want to have faith in the Word of God. We want to believe the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Amen? 
We want to believe the whole word of God. We want to believe that every word is true. Do you believe that there was a man called uh, Jonah that was in a whale? Do you believe that? Do you believe the ark existed and all that, and those animals went into the ark and that they were called and the door was closed by God himself when the animals were inside and the flood came and it was 40 days, 40 nights and we, we see the flood coming down and the whole earth was flooded. There's, there's evidence of it, of the water lines that are upon the earth everywhere, that there was water at some stage upon the earth. There again, the world will look for the truth and they'll find the Bible. <laughs> Isn't it powerful? And so by faith, we will please God. By, by faith, the, the, it penetrates into our hearts. And Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you want to fill up your faith tank, get some more of the Word. There's no shortcuts with God. Fill up your faith tank. You say, I'm low on faith. Fast, I need some more faith. Pray for me. I can pray for you now. Listen what happens. This is what happens in the Spirit. I pray for you now because I've got the faith. The person praying for you has got the faith. It's like an injection into you. You walk out of here, you're full of faith. You're like, oh, I can take on the world now. Full of faith, you know, full of power, full of glory. You stop reading your Bible. You stop spending time with Jesus. Next week, you want to come back for a new next refill. You see what Christians do these days? They get lazy. They get lazy. But God wants you every day. So that's why we move to the next one. So the F stands for faith, to live by faith. The A of faith stands for action. How many of you know faith should move you forward? Faith will always move you. Faith will never let you keep stagnant. You will keep on moving forward with God. You'll keep on doing the things. The two words, in the, the one in the Hebrew, imano, and the word in the Greek word, pistos, is, doesn't mean just intellectual faith. Both those words don't just mean intellectual faith. It doesn't just mean that we say, I believe. I stand in church. I put up my hands. I believe in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, where's the fruit? Faith has got another side. Faith is not just what you say. Faith is not just a declaration. Because we can declare these things. Even the demons believe and, sh and they shiver and shake. Shudder. Amen. But listen to this. The word, these two words mean the, the following, faithfulness, <laughs> amen, are you faithful to God? Loyalty, are you loyal to your Savior? And the next one is commitment. That's actually what those two words mean in the Hebrew and the Greek. They don't talk about intellectual faith, they're one that says, oh, I've got the faith, look at me. You see, sometimes we can make a lot of noise in faith, but there's no faithfulness, there's no loyalty, and there's no commitment. It's like love. We can tell someone we love them. My wife, I can tell her every day, honey, I love you. And then I'm, I'm un unfaithful behind her back. Do I still love her? It doesn't look like it in my actions. And then I speak bad about her. Puh, 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 puh. Do the other people know this wife of mine? <laughs> Shh, you know, she doesn't do anything, you know. <laughs> Or they say, but I love you, I love you, but, but, but my wife asked me to do something for yesterday, and I forgot today, and I forgot today, and I forgot again, and I forgot again. Am, am, I being, am, I being, am, am I being committed? You see the word faith, if you, it shows in your action, there's an action, the A is action. There needs to be faithfulness, there needs to be loyalty, there needs to be commitment, and these are the things we look for people in ministry for. These are actually, these are signs of faith, not just the big, you can stand and preach in the front, but we're going to look at your lifestyle. What's your character look like? They tested me for 21 years before I became, 22 years before I became the senior pastor of this year, church. Huh? Did Julius show some faithfulness? Did he commit? Was he loyal? Does he have the back of the leadership? When nobody else is looking. <laughs> so the questions we're asking, are we faithful? Are we loyal? Are we committed? Are we continuing with Jesus through the trials? Trials will come. Amen. Are we continuing? Are we faithful even when it gets tough? You know, over and over, it's so amazing. I've seen over and over during COVID and before COVID, there's a couple of cases that I've seen that people throw away the Christianity when the tough times come. It's like so easy to go, Mom, God! Who's this effing God? People post it on social media. And I'm shocked. 
and I'm hurt. I feel offended for God. <laughs> we go like, wow. I thought there was something deeper. But then again, you don't stop praying for people. Find yourself on your knees again praying for them. By the grace of God, they'll come back. People get angry with God. You need to be faithful, loyal, and committed. The eye of faith is intimacy. Matthew chapter 6. Close the door. Is the intimacy between you and God? Does God know you and do you know God? Does God know who you are? You know, we can, we can get into a place of, 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 of worshiping God in a form of religion, a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. Do you know when that happens? Can I tell you when that happens? It happens when you come into religious mode, when you don't spend time with God alone anymore, but you're relying on the experience that you have in Christianity and the words that you receive from other people, and you never hear from your Father yourself. I mean, if I never spend time with my father, how would I know who my father is? How would I know what he likes? How would I know what his character's like? How would I know anything about him? Our God is faithful. Our God is a loving God. We sang it tonight, you're holy, selfless. Thank you, Lord. You didn't keep the glory. Thank you, Lord. You share. Thank you, Lord, that you gave us your spirit. When last have you been in a solitary place with God to build Relationship and intimacy with Him. Not social media. <laughs> Not even someone else. Only alone. You and God. You and Jesus. When last have you been in a solitary place? When last have you been in solitary confinement with Jesus? Wasn't uh, That was lockdown. was good for that. Do you know that? When we had 21 days, we were all going, yes, 21 days. 21 days of food. Okay, much longer. <laughs> 21 days became another two weeks, another five, another extended, extended. But initially people were going like, Whew. some said this is the worst thing that could happen. Other people said this is the best thing. I should, have, I should have taken a rest from what I'm doing a long time ago. I suddenly realized how little time I spend with God. Amen? The I, intimacy. Are you intimate with God? The T of faith, touching. Are you touching God and touching people? Are you touching heaven and touching earth? I want to read this scripture to you. It's John chapter 15, verse 5 to 8. How many of you know what it says? John chapter 15, you know it. The vine and the branches. John chapter 15, verse 5 says, Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are, the true, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. It's up to verse 8 there. I love what it says there. When you produce much fruit, verse 8, you are my true disciples. How do you know that we are true disciples? When we have much fruit. There needs to be fruit. How would prophets know, be known by their fruit? You see, you need to look at the lifestyle. You need to look at the everyday. This brings great glory to my Father. God's looking for consistency. God's looking for loyalty. God's looking for commitment. God's looking for people that will stay and stand the test of time. Amen. But we can only do that by the Spirit of God. Supernatural fruit will be produced. How many of you know that it says here, He is the vine and we are the branches. We must be connected to Jesus the whole time. Connected to the vine. We cannot operate on our own. We cannot go outside of what God wants for us. Because He's the vine. He's the sap. Amen. He's the one that brings you the juice. Amen. To keep going. If you don't have any juice anymore, it means you've disconnected from the vine. You've Jumped off the vine and said, I don't need the vine anymore. I'm a branch all by myself. Look at me. I'm cool. Look at me. I'm the branch. What the vine? The vine. Who's the vine? I'm the vine. I'm the branch. I'm the man. And then you start getting dry. Now you're useless. Now you get thrown on a pile to be. That's not a joke. That's hectic. 
That's talking about hell. That's useless in the kingdom. That's saying it's that one that says, oh, why do I need to be part of the vine? Why is God getting all the glory, man? I need some glory. That's when people begin to worship people. They start withering those branches. You'll see what will happen is when someone is worshipped, I can promise you they'll fall. The frame of man was not designed to be worshipped. Only God can be worshipped. Only God can actually handle worship. We are not idols to be worshipped. Amen. When you become an idol, you are setting yourself up for the greatest fall. You can have a church of five million people. It doesn't matter. You can be the greatest preacher on earth. Popularity has never stood with God. Amen. This stuff is what stands with God. When God sees that you're faithful, you're committed, you're loyal to His name, you're producing the fruit, and people must be able to pick up that fruit in your life. See, there's fruit in His life. There's fruit in her life. I can pick from it. I can see there's fruit in their life. Not just on a Sunday. Amen. Supernatural fruit is produced in your life when you touch, when you connect it into the vine. It needs to be in every habit. You see, it's easy to be religious in front of people, but not in front of God. We can't fool God. The Bible says God cannot be mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. If you put bad seed into the ground in your private life, you're going to reap it somewhere in your public life. What's sown in the dark will come into the light eventually as a fruit that's fraught. So if you're seeing things being produced in your life that's not good, you're knowing that you were sowing seeds somewhere in your life that was in the dark and you were busy sowing seeds, it could be in the form of many things. Where do you spend your time? And I put on the last one, the H, is we have a home that's being prepared for us. And if you walk by faith in Jesus, you'll not be disappointed because where you're going is much better where you are now. But we're not there yet. We've got to help other people. We've still got to help other people along. we still get people saved. It's all about souls. It's all about getting people saved. It's all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's all about preaching this gospel, living this gospel, being true disciples. True disciples produce much fruit. I want to produce much fruit for you, Jesus. I need your help. I can't do this. I need to be connected to the vine. I cannot be the cool branch that goes off on his own and says, I don't need this vine that's connected here. What's all this vine connections going on here? I need Jesus every day. I need to be desperate for him. The minute that I don't think I need Jesus is the minute I'm in trouble. The minute that I'm not thirsty anymore, the minute that I'm not hungry anymore, the minute when I don't want to see more, the minute when I don't want to do more for God, the minute when I start feeling like that I'm busy going in a different direction, the minute that I start listening to the wrong people and stop spending time with the right people, because even sometimes the right people will tell you things you don't like. Your best friends in life are not the ones that agree with you all the time. Your best friends in life will sometimes reprimand you. Your best friends will sometimes say, oh, that's dangerous, what are you doing? Gordon? No, man. <laughs> Gordon will go, sorry, sorry. <laughs> hey? That's your best friends in life, those that can tell you the truth because they love you. That's what family should be doing. Saying, no, 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 I think you messed up there now. Come on, come back, come back with us. Come, we're on a journey here together. Ezekiel, amen. Your best friends can tell you, I don't like that. Don't do that. Your best friends will stick with you through thick and thin. My best friend's sitting in the front here. Amen. Besides Jesus, but on earth. Amen. Praise the Lord.